here, America. I'm Star Parker. Well, I guess it's time for me to put my surfboard back into the closet because the wave, well, it didn't happen the way that everybody thought it would. But I'm still very, very encouraged because God is still on the throne and he's still very concerned about our culture, our country, and whether we as Christian conservatives are going to articulate the message of freedom to where people actually understand how they impact their own individual lives and then they start voting their values. But one of the issues on the table, if you will, and was on the table through this election were the schools themselves. So I am just so blessed to have a really exciting guest. And I'm going to keep a couple of segments. Um, one of my friends, actually, Armstrong Williams. Many of you may know Armstrong. He's an entrepreneur. He's a, he's a your syndicated columnist. He has done so many things. He owns one of the largest television network syndicates in the country. In fact, I think it's the largest black owned uh, in the country and in the world. Uh, but he's a dear friend. I first met Armstrong. I think we were working on Clarence Tom. I was trying to get him on the bench, and that just shows how old we are. But I am so very honored to have you in studio today. Uh, I'm just honored that you invited me in your house. <laughs> <laughs> it is my house. I've been in yours. I've been on your show uh, many a times. And, you know, we could go all over the place when it comes to discussion because you've been in and around D.C. a long time. Our original roots, I think why uh, I, you kind of became my mentor. People always ask me, who do you like? Who do you, what do you follow? Well, I watch Armstrong's show every weekend. It comes on here in Washington, D.C. And so when I'm in town, I pick it up on, on Saturdays, I believe it is, uh, and make sure that you have just the most amazing guests. But also, I think that during that time we were with Clarence Thomas, I found that you were from South Carolina, and that's where my original uh, heritage or roots, uh, family roots are. And so I've been a part of watching you uh, through your career as I built my career here in Washington. And one thing that has remained very consistent is your Christianity, your worldview. And so when I found that you just did a new book, Crises in the Classroom, individuals from vastly different political spectrums uh, or perspectives agree that there is a crisis in the classroom. The crisis showed up to some degree in these last uh, midterm elections, but I don't know that anyone articulated the way that you and Dr. Ben Carson and Benjamin Crump explained it here. Give us the backstory. First of all, why did you decide to write this book at this moment in history? Well, I, I go back, as you often talk about your childhood, and when I think about growing up with my parents, and I was blessed to have a two-parent household, the best department of health and education and welfare I had growing up star was my mother and my father. Yeah, my father yeah. And in that household, reading books, the library was a centerpiece. You had to earn the right to watch TV for a week, for maybe two hours. Um, you had to earn the right to play sports by your academic excellence. And so when I was a kid growing up, books took me to places like Europe and Africa and Asia uh, and the Middle East. And it helped me learn about culture. It helped me learn about behavior. And so um, before I ever entered kindergarten, like my brothers and sisters, um, the intellectual gap is already there. Mm -hmm. I understand, which is a chapter in, in, the, in the book, on the crisis in parenting, mm -hmm. how we place so much weight on the teacher right. and on the classroom, but so much of it has to do with the parents. And unfortunately, we forget that some of the parents today themselves are illiterate. That's right. They are uneducated. And yet, you take Dr. Carson, who's a collaborator on this book, his mother could not read, right. but she was wise enough to give him books and to put him in an environment where he could learn to read and around people that read back to him. So even though you may not have gotten that education, you still have the wisdom and the ability to make sure that your children are not on that same path. And when you think about um, children from to the prison pipeline, it is far better and far less expensive to educate kids in the classroom than to try to save them once they're in the penal system. Yes. But let's go to one point that you just made. The teacher themselves, by the time they get to the kindergarten, they're coming out of these broken environments now, disproportionately African-Americans, and they're, they're, they already start with a really hard job. So I want to go there. 
What has broken down that to such a degree that there are so many now in our community who cannot say that same story. I grew up in a household with a mom and a dad, and they focused on reading. This is not our history. So what happened? Well, you know, um, before the passage of the civil rights legislation, and we know about the bigotry, the day jury segregation, the raw racism in America, but still, 78% of black households were educated. Yeah. They were literate. That's right. They had thriving businesses. Their families were together. Divorce rate was less than 6%. Because they held on to their faith, they held on to education, they held on to discipline. But they had a father in the household who set an example of what she, her daughter should look for in a husband and what a man, what being a man is. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we have these young people today, especially young men, pretending, wearing their pants baggy, be believing they don't have to do the fisticuffs when we had to work something out on the playground when someone went is mad. We didn't go for the knife. We didn't go for the gun. We did the fisticuff. Mm -hmm. Some, today, they don't know what it means to be a man. Mm -hmm. And when a man is not in their household, especially young boys and daughters, they are broken. These kids are broken. Mm -hmm. They're paralyzed. And yes, many in this country and around the world still find a way to thrive and survive and become huge contrib contributors to the world. But still, there's a brokenness. Just like when I, when I lost my father and then I lost my mother, I realized I was an orphan. There was something I could never get back. Mm -hmm. And what parents teach you and what fathers teach you through examples about what work ethic is, why education is important, why you've got to do your homework. And even when they don't even have one. I and mean, we were talking, you went back to the 60s and a little bit before, these were blue collar workers. These were roll up your sleeves. We don't, we can barely uh, be illiterate and or uh, uh, read a book, but we're going to make sure that you do. And when you mentioned that prison pipeline, when I saw that data, that 73% of those young men that are in our youth cr criminal system come from single headed households, it just took my breath away. We, we This is not where we were going uh, in the history of black people. So in this book, Crisis in the Class, Classroom, it's almost like you're saying we can correct some of these things that are broken down in family life, but how can we correct them, Armstrong, in an environment that is running so away from the founding principles, which included faith in God? You don't allow for God to be in the home or in the communities anymore, and we're letting this negative energy override the positive energy. It seems like the damage is already done before they even get to that classroom. Well, you, you speak about faith and our moral heritage. You see, faith and fear cannot exist. Together. Together. Yeah. They just cannot yeah. exist. Yeah. Right. You know, my parents, mm. and you know, we come from a household with 10 children, right. Right. Um, <laughs> eight boys and two girls. And you, who've come from a family, you know, you have your cousins and sometimes in your own household who are on a slower track in the classroom. Mm -hmm. They're not grasped the math, mm -hmm. or the writing, mm -hmm. or the languages, like the French and the Spanish you had to learn when we were growing up as kids. But the one thing that we had uh, that I think is so missing today is that my parents believed no matter how slow we started, we always had the capacity to learn. Mm -hmm. No matter how difficult it was, my parents would get us the tools, my parents would get us the books, because one of the things we had to do before going to the classroom was that we had to read the book. Mm -hmm. My fellow parents felt that gave us an advantage going to the classroom. Today, many, many administrative school systems don't believe these kids can learn, and what do they do? They dumb down education. Instead right. of making these kids measure up right. to what the bar is, right. they lower the bar. That's right. Whether it's in math, right. English, science, they lower the bar. Right. And they give them grades and give them trophies and certificates they have not earned. This is false earn. self-esteem. Right. It is false self-esteem and it's damaging that child. But you mentioned how there's this uh, I guess you could say, or well, the soft bigotry that, that Bush talked about of low expectations that have poisoned the minds of even some of the teachers that they don't have the capacity to learn. They're not going to be able to pick these things up because of their environment. And we actually, there's two dynamics, and 
and I want you to address both of them. One is what we expect from those that are from more broken environments and zip codes uh, and have and broken homes. You know, do they have that capacity? Can we build in our society an understanding that no matter where you started, you don't have to finish there? But number two, I want you to address the political dynamic because Cure, uh, my group, we ran billboards during their so-called summer of love after George Floyd when they were having peaceful protests and and just destroying the whole country. So we ran billboards in a lot of these urban communities uh, with the success sequence. We said, if you really want out of poverty, all you gotta do is these few things. Finish school, take any job, get married, save and invest, give back to your community. And Black Lives Matters demanded that Clear Channel take those boards down. They threatened the parent company, Clear Channel Outdoor, and told them, you take them down or we're gonna burn them down. So there are two things going on here. One is, as you pointed out, there are people that really don't believe that these folks that come from distressed communities and families uh, have have the capacity to pull it back together. And you mentioned your friend, who, your longtime friend, Ben Carson, is a living proof that, yes, you can pull it back together. Uh, but number two, we're up against a political energy that just doesn't want people that are disproportionately now from these communities, uh, not just not to live, because they keep aborting us off, but also to, um, to not let the message of freedom get there. Well, you know, the thing that we forget, Star, is that freedom does not come from man. Freedom comes from God. Amen. It takes just as much to maintain it as it did to establish it. Yeah. And freedom is not for the faint of heart. And you, you mentioned yeah, black, self governing is hard. You yeah. mentioned yeah. Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Black Lives Matter. Any time a part of your doctrine is that you don't believe in the traditional family. Yeah. And they did not believe in the no, traditional family. No, no. Anytime and still they, don't. We're not hearing from them as much as we did two summers ago, but they're still out there. No. Why? Yeah. <laughs> because the spotlight has been put on their greed yeah. and their true agenda. This is what the Bible tells us for all of us. Whatever is done in the dark mm -hmm. will come to light. Yeah. Theirs was more about their own self-interest, not the interest of building a family. And also, anytime you have any organizations d just, just diminishing the value of law enforcement, Enforcement and diminishing mm -hmm. the value of institutions, diminishing the value of books and the schools. These arguments about we need to take down these relics, like these statues, and 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 where instead good of good people, we saved one. We had to save the emancipation. It's like that guy is not kneeling at Lincoln. He's getting up. This was the last fugitive slave. This is a real person. You're right, and they want to tear him down. Meaninglessness was just running and, through and, the and streets. Listen, and I agree. Here's what I agree. I agree we should celebrate all our history, the good, the bad, the sordid. But instead of taking something down, yeah. add, more add more to the chapters. Yeah. Tell more yeah. of the story because that is still a part of our history. Well, one thing that you do that I really appreciate on your show every year is you do interview with Dr. Carson on the mall about black history. I mean, the yeah. guy is like a, a, <laughs> an encyclopedia on who created what, who yeah. made what, who was a scientist then, who was a scientist there, and you're sitting there kind of taking notes. I want to keep you over, if you don't mind, for sure. another segment, yeah. because i got to get into this crisis in the classroom. We need to see what he's saying inside, what Dr. Um, Carson is saying, and then also you have somebody else that's not normally with us. Ben Crump is also saying, uh, and we'll get to inside of this book right after this message. I know it's not my words that helps a person, it's God's word. It's the power of the gospel. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to this earth to take our sins. But on the third day, God raised his son to life. The Bible says, but he wants everyone to come in repentance. But you ask Christ into your heart, he'll give you that strength, he'll give you that power. But you've got to be willing to say, God help me by faith. Trust Jesus Christ. God birthed in my heart years ago to do this work of CURE, the Center for Urban Renewal and Education. We are incredibly privileged to have pastors from across the nation here for training and collaboration on solutions to help our communities. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It must be fought for. The Declaration meant what it said. All men are created equal.
word to awaken, train, and mobilize the church as a whole, but the historically black church in particular, to end abortion in our communities. Every church needs to do everything it can to help be an educational hub. The crisis of the day is the sexual gone wrong, and it's going extraordinarily wrong. Us Christians are called to correct that by living the sexuality that God has given us. It was the church who created the idea of educating every boy and girl. The idea of public health care, guess where that came from? The church, and it was actually the church who was commissioned to do the work of charity. Guess who's actually robbed you a part of what it is that you're to do? It's government, and they failed miserably at it. They're not called to do it. Government is not God. Are we gonna bow to government, or are we gonna bow to God? Kids need to see that confidence that we have about the truth. We're not in doubt about who we are. Crises in the classroom. Well, I think a whole lot of people knew that there were crises in the classroom for a long time. That's why there's been this movement for 30 years or so to get our kids out of these pagan schools and let the money follow them to schools parents want. And Armstrong Williams, has, my friend, has done a book with a couple of other people that you may know, Benjamin, uh, Benjamin you put Benjamin Carson, who calls him Benjamin Carson? With Ben Carson and Benjamin Crump, which I was surprised to see because this is a liberal. So when I found out that they had done this book, on topics that in African-American community we've been concerned a long time about the quality of education uh, in our country and in their communities. But when it hit the front page during COVID, where now suburban parents were looking at what their kids are being taught, ah, we started seeing some momentum. Now we see a decision from the Supreme Court saying, well, maybe we can rethink education and how we do it. So thanks for being my guest uh, here this, um, this week on Cure America. Uh, Armstrong, I want to get into a little bit about, first of all, I want to know how in the world did you even uh, get Benjamin Crump to say I'm gonna put a book together with two conservative Christians you know that is such an important question and what many members of your listening audience may not be aware of um, there was a lawsuit filed in the Baltimore school system which has one of the worst educational crises in the country and the lawsuit was very unique it was filed that parents are paying all this money towards education, almost 18,000 per pupil, and yet 50% of the- $18,000 per, per pupil, pupil per year. Per year, and yet- In classrooms of 30 to 40 kids. That's right. Go ahead. And yet 50% of the, the entire school system has less than a 1.0 point average. And so they said that is malpractice. It's, they filed this lawsuit, and never before in the history of this country has a lawsuit ever like of this nature has been allowed to be to go forward by the courts. Wow. Ben Crump and our friendship of over 10 years, mm -hmm. uh, I had been telling him about this lawsuit. You know, you fight for the victims of police brutality, you fight for these victims of racism. But I tell, I think what is just is equally important is fighting these for these kids that have become ghost kids who've been passed through schools, end up becoming squeegee kids. No no self-esteem, no self-worth, no skills. They become this criminal pipeline. The young girls become pr prostitutes. They become a part of the sexual trafficking. You got to start with an education. I, I, I told him, if a child has an education, the likelihood of them ending up in prison and on the street, they have a 90% chance of succeeding. He joined the lawsuit. Yeah, but I, what, what, when did the lights come on? Because now you're, this is your friend. You, you knew, and we know, we know how liberal he is, but it, but it would seem, and I'm, I guess it's a rhetorical, because it would seem that there would be many that America has worked for that would start to say, maybe something else has gone wrong. What was that moment that he said, I hear you, dude, and I'm gonna look at it His wife okay. is a school teacher. Okay. And his he hear her complaints come home and, every day. And in their <laughs> pillow talk, he yeah. was talking to his wife about what we were doing. And he was shocked to hear what as though, as someone he's known so long, what she revealed to him What's about the classroom, classroom that mirrored. And not only wow. did he join the lawsuit, but uh, start just last week, for the first time in the history of the United States, the judge allowed the lawsuit 
to go forward. So this is still moving. Yeah, all across the country. It's not okay. just about Baltimore. And, okay. and in the book, while Carson talks about morality, mm -hmm. while he talks about faith, mm -hmm. Ben Crump talks about um, public education, and he talks about the role that teachers play, and that teachers are less of the problem, and it's more of a bureaucracy. The one thing that I talk about, and and you would not believe the kind of support that Crump has gotten from black parents across the country. Oh, I'm not parents surprised. Parents walks a lot, said, thank you for putting They've us They've known something's gone put, wrong. Putting politics aside, but, yeah, but yeah. what you realize is that private education work, charter school work. We know, every, every time we open up any kind an of, answer. well, it, a million people on the waiting list? Yes. When you start thinking, getting into the real core of the of the of the the challenge, it's I don't care how sick that woman is and how many street hustlers she's been with, she still wants the best for her children. These yes. are the ones that keep begging us for school choice. These are the ones that if I could only get that little money to follow me, I'm going to put them to the Christian school. And they haven't been in the church forever. So it's just really fascinating to me that you've gotten him his ear because we've gone through all of the other rhetoric. We keep hearing the same thing about why the police over are over aggressive in these poorer communities. We keep hearing the same thing about, but it's racism of the 60s and 50s. But you've been able to bring him over. And this is really interesting because many a teachers have looked back and said what's gone wrong. They're, it's not the school of yesterday that you explained of your parents to where when you go and learn, you're not going to end up dead. Well, start, you, it's a war zone. Yeah, it's absolutely. It has become a war zone. Yeah, I, I know. Spitting on teachers. It's bad. Threatening teachers. That's right. Hitting teachers. That's right. And, 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 only, and then trapped in that school because of your zip code. So let, let, let's get into a little bit. We only have a few minutes and I could keep you all day and I'm going to have to have you back because you're, you've been th you have such a long track record in working in activism in D.C. and all of the place. You're just a majorly successful businessman. I so admire you. But okay, so you have, okay, so you did a few chapters here, but then you said that ben, he did the, Kate, the crisis of death. So he actually looks at the breakdown? It, the lack of education is the reason why many of our black babies are in the grave today. Wow. That's right. It is a crisis of death. It says it's only a man. Yes. Wow. But through his lawsuits, wow. where, whether it's Buffalo, whether it's Rochester, he has seen in these families mm -hmm. the lack of education mm -hmm. and the burden it places on these families. Mm -hmm. And you will end, it's just a matter of time before you end up in a cemetery unless you give these kids a quality help access to a quality education. Well, it's now, their passport. Now, the, the, the school choice movement has been predominantly libertarian, conservative, so therefore Republican. So my final question, because we're running out of time on this one, it's, you mentioned moving beyond politics. Is this our moment? Are we going to be able to, coming out of these midterms, which are just a patchwork of confusion to what voters are really thinking is important? President Biden told us it was about worldview and the soul of America, but it doesn't sound like too many people understood what that meant, that we are really fighting for the heart and soul, what kind of people we're going to be. What is our culture going to look like? I, f I have a feeling, just based on what you're saying about Crump, that we, we, we could be crossing over, at least in the black community, to say, the rhetoric isn't enough anymore. The crisis is in our face. We want real answers. I think, Crump, we're saying the same thing that Americans said in the recent election. It's not a red mandate. It's not a blue mandate. The mandate is that we want both sides to cross the aisles to work for the good of the people. Mm -hmm. Stop this crime. Get inflation under control. Put Americans first. Um, get this economy thriving again. Mm -hmm. And stop this bickering. We don't care if you're left or right, conservative a liberal. What we care about, that it works for everyday Americans. And this is what Crump is saying. I could care less if I'm a liberal. This is a crisis in education that all sides must come yeah, across you know the what? aisle. I'm going to push you back. I, I'm going to have to ask you another question because i got to keep you a few more minutes because I'm pushing back because this is not the first time we've heard liberals say this, but then they they have a strong Congressional Black Caucus that votes against educational options every time they get a chance. That now has grown out into a progressive caucus that every Congressional Black Caucus member is a part of. And so we talk all day about really making fundamental changes in education and what happens in that weakest zip code, and then it doesn't change. He is one of the icons yes, of the civil is. rights movement. Yeah. And they they have criticized him, they maligned him, they threatened him with hit pieces, wow. and he said, this is the moral thing. And if you care about your children, you will join me in this movement. Forget about who I've written this book with, you should focus on what we've written in the book. Mm -hmm. How do we save our kids 
from prison and ultimately death. Is he getting traction? Yeah, I mean, yes. with the pastors and everybody else in the community and, that really cares? And some members of the Congressional Black Caucus sorry, and the listen. Civil Rights and across the board, you would be shocked at the credibility and how he's Force them to open up because you know wow. you don't have to force them. You have to convince them about the problem. No. They know the problem they know the exists, problem. They, and they yeah. know how to solve the problem. But for, for political expediency, they cannot be seen embracing this because it's not something that normally democratic ideas and ideology embrace. They were. Oh, 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 so so you're telling me that there are those that are sitting here in Washington, D.C., inside of the Congressional Black Caucus, every single one of them reelected because those margins, I mean, some of them are coming back only 20,000 votes in their whole district um, because people just are not that active, are coming back here. You're telling me that they don't buy, some of them don't buy the idea of progressivism and socialism, oh, that this don't. is just expediency? Absolutely not. Oh, no question they don't. Well then, what, if you, then what, if, what kind of leader is that? What kind of what kind of politician would know the truth and then not communicate it to because their because loyalty to, to political the party. party and political ideology is going to be the death knell of America. We should be loyal to our faith, mm -hmm. to God, and what works, and kick political parties to the side. Oh goodness! And all of us are guilty of it. Yeah, I know. Not just the left. Oh, I know. I'm guilty of it too. But I tell you, um, I do want to need one more little thing. What, what has Ben Carson talking about in here? Oh, well, you guys got to go get it. It's, it's available what next week it's, or it's, two? It's in stores now. It's in, it's in stores, stores now. now. Yeah. Okay. Crisis so Amazon, in the books. classroom. Amazon or any of your favorite. Final question for real. This time, final, final, because I'm this clock's gonna run out. Um, ben, what is he telling us? Morality. Okay. The importance of faith and God, nobody wants to acknowledge God anymore, right, right. as if he has no role in this. Right. And God is always in the details, whether you acknowledge him or not. And, and connecting it to family, though, because fam that's where I think that, that we're, is what we've broken saved down, too. A lot of families mm -hmm. who've struggled through strife mm -hmm. and hardship mm -hmm. is their faith in their creator, okay. that he's brought them through some of the toughest storms that mankind has ever faced, right. and particularly yeah this young country we call America. I know, it's a beautiful country. I think that we're only getting started. We've had to sort through many a crises. Uh, now we're sorting through the crises in the classroom. It couldn't be much more timely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arch, I'm supposed to thank you. And um, oh, oh, and don't forget that he is a, has a holding company that broadcasts television stations around the United States. And so he's one of the largest owners and has his own show. So make sure that you tune in. Some of the guests are just um, incredible. I mean, he gets these top guys, even the presidents. You've uh, but more than one president. He's been, what, 30 years now doing all these presidents and all these <laughs> big names. And, and, and I just love the brother. But make sure that you pick up his book. And I'm going to be right back with my panel uh, after this important message. Today, a student in public school will pray or lead a Bible study. Today, a pastor will preach boldly the truth of the scriptures without fear of the IRS. Today, the life of an innocent child will be saved. And a mother will experience the joy of a newborn baby, a distraught woman, will find hope and choose life rather than death. Today there is a strong voice defending God's created natural order of marriage and family. There is a defender of freedom in the courtroom and in the halls of Congress and in legislative bodies across the land. Today all of this is possible because of the ministry of Liberty Council. People from all over America will find help and hope because of Liberty Council. The adversity they face will be turned into victory, case by case, law by law, person by person, Liberty Council is advancing religious freedom, the sanctity of human life, and the family through litigation, education, and public policy. And that is the mission of Liberty Council, to restore the culture by advancing life, liberty, and family. Well, Armstrong sure made me feel good about tomorrow uh, because we're going to this crisis in the classroom, we're going to handle that, too. We're, the issues are continuing, even though we had a real interesting um, uh, midterms, if you will, uh, complex for sure. Uh, but voters know what they want. They're going into the polls, and we still live in a country that we can. So we're going to get into a little bit of discussion about this with Jonathan Alexandre. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thanks so much for having me on a, on a new day. <laughs> yeah, a new day. But I guess you didn't want to watch it in live time, so you went and enjoyed a Christian concert? Yeah, I was able to be with the saints, about 10,000 of us. Wow. <laughs> but wow. We're, we're worshiping and, and glorifying wow. God is, is going to be done regardless of whatever results come out. Well, and that is true. 
and he's moving, you know, according to his will. I mean, the scripture is really clear for, for what we're to do, look deeper for him when he seems hidden, but also to know that we're on his clock. Yes, and so there is some hope there. Uh, Liberty Council Action, uh, he's senior counsel over there, Jonathan. And then Richard Manning right here with me, president of Americas for Limited Government, co-author on Necessary Noise. Okay, Richard, so we were arguing uh, two years ago, three years ago, that this noise of Trump uh, is necessary for the country. We need to have discussions about things that matter to God, but might matter to us in individual, individual pieces. Um, are you encouraged today? I think where our point was made, and quite honestly, there was a decision made by the Republican Brain Trust not to talk about these issues, to not confront these issues. And as a result, by avoiding them, they let the left carry the day on the playing field. Yeah, right. And you know, they, we, call it, we call it necessary noise because it's necessary noise. To have these and if you don't, And if you don't confront evil, you are accepting evil. And the concept, and the Republicans didn't run a campaign that dealt with these issues sets at all because they said, all people care about is inflation. Well, the truth is, people care about what's happening to their kids in the schools. People care about what they're being taught in the schools. People care about what's happening on their streets and crime and the like, and what leads to it. And if you don't go at the root causes of evil that are causing problems in your community, you have missed the boat from a political perspective, because at that point, it's just a personality contest. And is that what you were feeling after you got some of the news that even though you know praise and worship continues and our fight continues, but um, it, it was a hard place to position a Christian message in what we've just been through the last 18 months. Well, I, I think you're right. I think going to the previous interview that you had on, on the classroom, you saw that being a winning issue, particularly for Christians, Christians in Florida, you know, this so-called, as they named it, the don't say gay bill, all it was saying is, hey, we're only going to teach the proper things at age appropriate times to kids. We're not going to fill them up with this transgender uh, junk science rubbish at an early age. And Ron DeSantis, who ran firmly on that uh, returning a rational understanding to education, won on that. Glenn Youngkin, a few years ago, won on that. There are 200... Ron DeSantis won on it the year before, when he first swept in. Now, I know that the former president tries to get all credit for him uh, gaining that governorship the first round. Mm -hmm. But if you recall, he only won by like 32,000 uh, votes, close. and it was on educational issues. He promised inside of our major, major um, cities and hard communities that he was going to allow parents to decide where they send their children to school. And that was the first time in the history that I know of right. that he received 18 percent of the black female vote in that first election. I haven't seen any numbers on this one, but that's an excellent point that when are good guys, and I'm calling them good guys on purpose because those of you that don't follow politics a lot and get caught up in the, well, I don't want anything uh, in terms of the branding of the parties, no, there are real differences in the principles of these parties. And so the good guys with the, with the platform that says we protect the interests of individuals, we protect the interest of babies in the womb, we protect the interest of, of traditional conjugal marriage, um, when they run away from those things, it was really evident in this one. Yeah, you know, the one thing you knew is the Democrats were attacking, viciously attacking Republicans as being, for being pro-life. And you never saw the Republicans coming back and saying, and showing a sonogram and saying, this is, the, this is the life we're protecting. That you never saw that at. You never saw you talk about baby body parts being sold by Planned Parenthood right. or funded by the left, funded by the Democrats. You never saw any of those things because the Republican strategy was to roll up in a ball like a pill bug yeah. and say, you're going to vote for me because you don't like the other guys, as opposed to providing them with an affirmative reason to do it. And once Especially the, on that point, but, because when you think with three states codified <laughs> Including Kentucky. In their, well, that was a different one. They weren't right. codifying. They right. were voting against right. a, a, a bill that, yeah. for the good guys right. that were putting on. Yeah. But those three that now it's in their constitution, right. this is leading us back to a national discussion. And, and probably even worse than it was before then, this Michigan and California ballot. It's basically infanticide. If a baby is found dead, you cannot ask uh, what caused that baby to die. And we have bills in Maryland that are doing the same thing. The contrapositive to that and these silver lining uh, in states like North Carolina where we have a better Supreme Court, 
Mm -hmm. uh, states like South Carolina have already heard their mm -hmm. pro-life case. Kentucky, mm -hmm. I think, uh, as soon as this airs, will be uh, arguing in favor of their pro-life law. So we'll have a number of states considering their pro-life laws in the judiciary. And I think that is a silver lining. Mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, these candidates that ran away from the issue, mm -hmm. like ostriches, putting their head in the sand, hoping that it went away, they were wrong. And it's something that we need to keep talking about. And, and just, just to make the point, when I was, a long time ago, I was a lobbyist for National Rifle Association. Mm -hmm. It wasn't single, that long ago, you single, still a young man. As, okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, a, a you were single, a lobbyist? A, 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 yeah, a single issue uh, advocacy organization. And what was always true in elections was I could, I could say whatever I wanted to to people who were paying their money to have me tell them what, tell them what I was thinking. But if a candidate did not resonate, did not say the same thing, if they didn't hear the same thing out of the candidate's ears, it, it became a moot point. That is it. It and, is. And, that's a, and that was true. We saw that last Tuesday. It's what happened. Mm -hmm. And the lesson that's learned is, should be learned, is don't run away from cultural issues. Stand up and fight, because Ron DeSantis stood up and fight. Mm -hmm. And he got rewarded. But exactly. when you run away, you get punished. And, 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 and just quickly, Brian Kemp as well, you mentioned the ability to vote. We heard that you know there was a Jim Crow 2.0 oh, in, right. in Georgia. They stood yeah. firm. Imagine what this would have looked like if the Senate had passed an HR1 and they completely overhauled our ability to vote. The fact that uh, not just DeSantis, but Brian Kemp stood tall on mm -hmm. a principle yes, is right. why he was victorious as well. Well, now, I want to know, because there were some really good people. In fact, one of your, one gal that you were really supporting here in the Washington, D.C. area, that relentless ads from the left that this girl was just a space cadet on abortion, but why didn't she run ads to to qualify her record, to tell us the things that you just said. Where, what, what, no, is, is there's such a hold over the party, of the, the people of the party, that they're afraid to speak into this. Well, Last uh, week when we had Ed Carr, and you remember yeah, the point he made, goes, is that yeah. they're going to come in here and oh, get indoctrinated. Yeah. yeah. Well, let me, first of all, in that race, mm -hmm. the Democrat incumbent had spent $22 million on congressional race. $22 million. Wow. Most of that came from, from groups like Democratic Congressional Campaign Fund, mm -hmm. but 22, and they had a message. It was, we're going to demonize you for supporting uh, pr being a pro-life candidate. Right. She had Yesley Vega, who's the candidate we're talking about in Virginia Excuse 7, mm -hmm. a, a Hispanic woman mm -hmm. who's a naturalized citizen, was born in El Salvador, mm -hmm. is, a, uh, is a police officer. Yeah. Right. She's okay. a great so candidate. So great candidate and very articulate. She had about $2 million of her own, and she had about $6 million sent by, spent by a National Republican Congressional Committee or other leadership PACs. The leadership PACs are the ones that came in and, and spent the real money on TV because they had the money, right. and they wouldn't touch it. They weren't going to touch and it. And because they wouldn't touch it, she couldn't. She didn't touch it, at least not in terms of being on the air. Well, how was she with her only little two million and she, dollars and, well, anyway? And, and the fact that we're saying two million bucks okay. is little is so amazing. Did, so the, there were questions asked uh, when the Dobbs decision came down. Is this too close to the election for the, the the good guys to get their messaging right? For the conservatives to go out and explain what really happened? Because yeah. I'll tell you, every messaging that I saw in abortion was we ended it. The Dobbs, it's over, girls. You're going to have ten year olds who are going to be pregnant by, by a rapist, and they're not going to be able to, uh, you know, manage this, and we need to help them by having them kill that offspring. And it was very deafening silent but, on well, the other the, side. The Republican strategy was to say it's a state issue now. Well, here's what here's what they did then by saying it's a state issue. When the Democrats are saying no, it's a federal issue, what they said was we're not going to deal with it. So what, if you hear that and you're pro-life, what do you say? Well, it's I don't have to be concerned about this election because it's a state issue. Mm -hmm. And by, by that strategy, they essentially told pro-life voters, stay home. Wow. Yeah. And you have a, you know, Dr. Oz who, when he interprets what he means state issues, he says, well, it's local control that's going to be dealing with that. Now you're, you know, a young girl's going to be hearing it's going to be the mayor or the dog catcher that's going to be right. in the abortion room making the decision. So the messaging was wrong from the start. The principle is what needs to be uh, conversed about again. And yes, we had the opportunity to know that there was going to be an overturn of Roe v. Wade. The principle had to be there. And I think what is being revealed is how strong, uh, despite the platform being strong, how strong are these candidates going to continue being in terms of the principle? Uh, when we have the House, how strong is the bill that we're going to be 
placed on the floor in January of 2023, mm -hmm. uh, the anniversary of Roe. Mm -hmm. uh, how, if we get these- Are they gonna uh, rally it? They well, to your, well, well, yeah, probably, to your point, I wanna hear from you, Richard, because they, because we, you opened with, we we missed an opportunity. And, and and But you also said in that we missed an opportunity that there those that are Christian conservatives are in a good place to now push and yeah, make I, leadership I listen. So well, uh, are we going to b see this battle at the anniversary of Roe to it, codify it, the, the, it, the innocent, it to make sure that we save life. They don't want, they wanted to throw out there that, well, you guys are trying to do it, a national initiative. They ran ads everywhere. They're trying to abolish abortion all over the country. No, it was the Democrats that were trying to do right, that. Yeah. And then Lindsey Graham tried to stop them, at least to some degree. And then the leadership threw Lindsey Graham under the bus. So I want to know, are we really that solid? that we're going to say, oh no, we're forcing your hands now because this was a bad win even if we did vote by staying home. And I'll just say, in, in contrast to that, look at what it did in galvanizing the 18 to 20 year olds that were plus 28 in terms of a Democrat vote. The young voters, the youngest voters, got the message from the Democrats. We had nothing to counter it because we failed on principle. Well, that's, ah. And so the, here's what people will learn in Washington, D.C. The other side attacked us on abortion, we lost votes because of that. They will take no responsibility for their own for the fact that it, they lost votes because they didn't fight. Mm -hmm. And the uh, and It'll once, be all you, the conservatives once you go again. into once you to, once you decide that your best defense is to hide behind a wall, mm -hmm. that's what you're. It's really hard to get them out from behind the wall to start fighting. Mm -hmm. And so what people of of conscience need to do is they need to demand that their elected officials who might tell them back home they're pro pro life. They need to demand that they, when they're here, they put on the armor of God and fight. I, I, I want to explore that. I'm going to do that after this break because this is an a area that we were told through the election didn't matter. It didn't matter, these social issues. We were told that we should accept these secular GOP candidates. Mm -hmm. You know, just hold your nose if you have to. We were told that if the former president picks somebody, just rally them, don't ask any questions, uh, and we will then sort through after the election. It sounds like that's not the message that the Christians sitting in the church wanted to hear. It sounds like they're saying, look, when you're looking at something like what you've just described, a Kemp win by landslide and a walker going into a rig or runoff, runoff Something's wrong with the messaging, so we're going to talk about messaging right after this. I know it's not my words that helps a person. It's God's word. It's the power of the gospel. God loves you, but sin separates us from God. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to this earth to take our sins. He died on a cross for our sins. He was buried for our sins, but on the third day, God raised his son to life. God is patient with us. He's not wanting anyone to perish. The Bible says, but he wants everyone to come in repentance. And so if you come tonight to Christ, you've got to come willing to turn from your sin. You say, but Franklin, I don't think I can. But you ask Christ into your heart, he'll give you that strength. He'll give you that power. But you've got to be willing to say, God, help me. I want to change. I want to trust you. By faith, trust Jesus Christ. If I became a activist, if you will, for the red team, a voter for the red team, doing the red thing stuff because of the platform, guys, because of platform, because they were the party. When I read the party platform after a pastor got saved, got out of welfare, got out of drugs, got out of crime, got out of all these things, and then one day that pastor said, you have an obligation to vote. So I went and read the platforms, and the platforms of the Republicans were so much more aligned with the way that I had been taught to interpret the scripture sitting in this particular church. Democrat platform not only was really dark then, it's gotten darker. But 
we're now in an environment to where it seems like the GOP is just totally running away from its own platform. Yeah, I'll say, so when, when a candidate gets in office, if it's a GOP candidate, they vote according to their platform 74% of the time. When a Democrat gets in, they vote in 89% of the time. So it's much more consistent that a Democrat uh, politician will follow their platform than a Republican. So I think... What wait, 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 wait. So you're saying two things here. Wait, yeah. okay, so you said, so the Democrat... Not only will the candidate follow its platform, 89% of the times, when they 89% of the time he's running on it. So, so now to Democrat, it doesn't matter who that person is; they're exactly. doing platform. But the Republican, you said what? Only 74% of the time, and so 26% of the votes that a Republican will take will be against the platform. And I think we saw 26% of those candidates uh, being put out by uh, by all sorts of. Oh my gosh, I'm not surprised. Thrown, thrown oh, but remember, because remember when Romney was the candidate, he actually said, "Well." Who cares anything about that platform? It's right. meaningless. He said it out of his mouth, and we were like, wait, well, uh, you know, no. that was a bloodbath in there to kind of keep these things yeah. in the platform. Right, yeah. Republicans a look at the platform as a messaging document. Okay. Okay. Not as a governing document. Got it. The Democrats look at the platform as a messaging document and, and a governing and document, document, which is why Democrats, this is the most amazing thing. Nancy Pelosi had a five vote majority in the House. That's impossible to hold together. Yeah. And yet she held it together for two years. Wow. She, she didn't lose any votes. Cons people who are running as conservatives voted with Nancy Pelosi 100% of the time. And they got away with it, by the way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you look at this and you say, what, so where do you stand? What do you believe? And the problem is the pressure in Washington, D.C. on Republicans is to compromise on the platform. That's something for out there. And I've had more shouting matches with friends of mine, real honest to goodness friends who work on the Hill, just begging them, just do what's in your campaign brochure. Just, that's all, that's all I ask. Do that's what's in your campaign want. brochure that's and we will want. win. Yeah, we were at the Republican hangout, our organization. We decided to have dinner together to watch the results come in. And it was a big party because it's the place where the lobbyists hang out, mm -hmm. where the political consultants, after they went out and did all their damage with their monies and left the candidates out there hanging, it was just a, it was just. It, it was just uncomfortable because it was just such a, a party when we knew that that wave had not occurred. But I'm wondering on this, the opportunity for us to, okay, two questions, because number one, we just heard from Armstrong Williams, who has been able to get a really hardcore liberal to agree with him that something's fundamentally wrong in the schools, and we're going to do a lawsuit to try to fix them. And it actually made the point, told me that there are congressional black caucus members that maybe might agree with us. I don't know that that's true when I'm here in the city, when I see how they actually vote. Why is it that we didn't hold together, I guess is what I'm coming to, to bring those two points together? How is it that we can say for, to the liberal, well, you know, you need to compromise on these things, you need to see the real damage being done, sell the idea that they're going to be with us and then they vote 100% of the time, like you're just saying, do not move from uh, their steadiness of their platform, but ours are always caving. What's broken down? And then I want to talk about how do we cure it? What, well, is, what do we need to do? I will say there was a battle of who's going to be kingmaker in the election. You did have former President Trump oh. establish and come into certain states and say, well, this is how I want it to run. Yeah. Putting up candidates that weren't local, that folks didn't That's really true. have any regard for. And people yeah. still want local. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, no. they. You, what high school did you go to? And, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. and uh. what are you going to do about this specific corridor of the highway? Deal with my traffic mm -hmm. in this highway. That's where politics really are. But it really have, is, doesn't it? Yeah, you, you have all this money coming in. And, you know, Kingmaker and Trump, potential Kingmaker and, and Senator McConnell, trying to pick winners within states, and that's not how politics is done. I don't think we so either. You know, you're on an interesting point there, Jonathan, and, and help me sort through it, because I think that might be a part of what happened in Georgia with Kemp and then Walker, because when you have an outsider picking your candidate, having to move back to the state, look, I understand all that they were telling us, no, he's a hero from the state, he's a hero from the state, but don't understand any of the political in the state, and then you have a governor, one of my cousins, who don't, normally is not 100% going to go out and pull the lever for Republicans, but I asked her, I said, what happened there? And she said, oh, he's a pretty good governor. I don't like what he did on the gun thing, you know, to make it so that people could just go ahead and carry and they don't have to have permits and all that kind of stuff, but he's a good governor. Yeah. I'm, I'm wondering how much of that was really the reality in there, in Ohio? They're, they're, they're good folks. Rec so, recognize, being a governor is I mean, not Ohio, on, the one that, um, DeWine. Well, that's Ohio. Oh, it is, okay. Uh, the, yeah. Being a governor is about 
hands-on things, about roads and bridges. Mm -hmm. It's about things that affect your life. It's about schools. Right. Being a U.S. senator is about bigger ideas. Okay. And, it's a, and so when you're judging a U.S. senator, you're saying, what are the big ideas you're going to carry forward? And you're not, and truthfully, you're not as concerned about you know, what's going to happen on, uh, on your local street or where there's a stop sign. But they do want to know a, that you know that street. Know, but they want to yeah. know that you know that street. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'll just pick, I'll pick on Pennsylvania because it's the most obvious case. Um, Mehmet Oz One of voted. Seven he, he, lived, <laughs> he, he, he lived in New Jersey, OK? And he didn't run in New Jersey. He ran in Pennsylvania. And in 2018, he voted in the, Turkey, tur the election in Turkey. Okay, so it's really hard to have a real feel for Pennsylvania when you've never lived there and you're voting in foreign elections. And will, pre will, will former President Trump be judged by all this? I mean, are we going to actually have a discussion I mean, about I, what really happened? Are we going to have an autopsy again? Mm -hmm. or, or, or the conservatives yeah. going to be blamed for, well, you didn't come yeah. home. Well, you're black. You, you, you keep voting for the same people, and you're not getting good results. What, what, what's going to come out of this? Is I, anything true? Do you I, guys know my motto here, sorting through the noise of the news to find truth. Is I somebody going to say think, that out loud? I think President Trump needs to do a complete top to bottom evaluation. Stop thinking about when he's, when he's gonna run for president. Start thinking about, is my political operation right? And should I run for a president? Right, right. Because right now because, he seems like Samson uh, to me. Uh, I'm going to uh, take the whole party well, well, down. Well, well, his, well, his, and pos that's, his positives are incredibly positive, but his negatives His are, positives are, are, are and We have and courts. And you yeah. just mentioned some of the cases that we're looking at in different so, states. He did put, what, like 300 so, judges? Yeah. And, so, and, so I was just saying quickly, that there is a, a part that wants the unfinished business that he did do well started, in the presidency oh, okay. to continue. But once again, because of the 22nd Amendment, he only has four years. So if he's going to run on a platform of longevity, he can't serve more than one term. I think it's incumbent of, of the GOP to say, if we're looking for a decade-long, good conservative rule, let's look outside of someone who can only now, run Now, that is a point I hadn't heard. So, so because you're right, four years, and now you got to do it again, uh, right. is not enough time to really get uh, things done. You hear I, about I, people that want term limits, term limits. Like, I think one of the reasons six years is for the Senate is because it does take time to get things uh, done. I, 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 I would argue that President Trump needs to sit down and decide what he wants to accomplish. Right. And if he wants, what he wants Seems to accomplish. Seems like vengeance now, and if, which God said is his. And if nobody votes for somebody who spends all their time looking in the rearview mirror, mm -hmm. you vote for what's going to oh, happen, yes. not what happened. Right. Winston Churchill lost in 1946, right after winning the war. Wow. I mean, lost in 1946 because everybody, when they saw him, they saw the rearview mirror. They didn't see a pass forward. Mm -hmm. That's what President Trump needs to figure out, mm -hmm. is why he wants to be president, and the answer has to be better than right the wrongs in 2020. I think that it might even be a little deeper than that when we start thinking about the Christian aspect. I kind of want to get you guys' opinion on it. It could be that we're looking into the eyes of Samuel, 1 Samuel, mm -hmm. where God moved his anointing. When, when King Saul got on the wrong side of God, he took that anointing and gave it to David. We could be up against a, a spiritual serendipity, God reaching down. Because one of the reasons I started thinking about this more deeply is the way he went after DeSantis while he was trying to make the case for us. Yeah. We're, we're, we need, Pennsylvania was already a red state. And now here going after DeSantis, and that's exactly what we saw in 1 Samuel yeah. when, 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 when King uh, Saul so. saw that the ladies were singing, David killed tens of thousands. He went after David. And I, th right. I think that's a, that's a very good point, and it brings me back to the 2020 election. Uh, President Trump had on his website Trump Pride, and in the same week that he would hold tr evangelicals for Trump uh, rallies, he would have the same lineup of speakers that would do Trump Pride. Oh, no, I, 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 when I found that he, after dissing Mike, Yes. publicly going after this vice president who was so loyal to you, and then you go to Mar-a-Lago and have a, a, a gay gala? Yeah. The Lord's anointing doesn't support that sort of activity. No, it doesn't. Can, can, can I just stand up for him a little bit? I, was I, in, don't, I don't mind. I was I'm, just, I'm trying was, to hear the truth I, somewhere. I was in the room, in the Roosevelt Room of the White House, mm -hmm. when Donald Trump first heard Ralph Northam, the governor of Virginia at the time, mm -hmm. talk about killing babies on the table. Mm -hmm. And unscripted, nobody prompting him, he walked in that room and gave a 20-minute tutorial on how to talk 
about abortion and the evils of abortion. Wow. Nobody had to script him. It wasn't a po political thing. Mm -hmm. It's who he was. Right. So we can sit there and we can say, in my estimation, it's fair to say, there's a time and a place for everything. And he, what he did in Pennsylvania was the wrong time and the wrong place. Okay, but what uh, but, about, on but, this, about this gay question? Because here we're saying there's a crisis was, in the, in the I, classroom. I, you got people all over the country extremely concerned that we're mutilating kids through all this trans I, stuff. I, I, and, and then yet you're, I mean, there, 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 there are L, a G, a B, and a T. So how are or, you saying on two, one? Or two-spirited or a bunch of other things. It's the risk that we're going to have to take if we put a Trump forward. I think the last election showed us that the risk, the king-making risk that we relied on him in past that has been effective, I think, uh, in, in previous elections, it's not going to be consistent. He's, he, we're not going to be able to reliably rely on and, his putting and, a candidate and the forward. Truth is, or a new message out in front. Because I think that people were watching Pennsylvania and even um, Ohio to to see what that messenger was going to look like. And I think that you're right that about the rearview mirror. Where is the vision for tomorrow? When we first were introduced to him, he was speaking to people's hearts. Right. We knew we had a crisis at the border. We knew that we were overflowed with drugs and gangs and all of the rest of the things. We knew that one of the things that resonated with me was we need to fix these inner cities. But we also knew that we had flipped him on abortion. When he first showed up, he was like, well, I haven't thought much about it. But then when the reality hit him, he knew in his heart and he was the first to speak and, and, at the right at and, the march. And, and, it, and it wasn't a political move. No, it, was it wasn't. A, a personal move. I know. So, I think, so can I, he personally move again? We got like one minute. Can that, that personally move again or, the, or the has God is, moved that anointing the, and we need to go out there and see I, who's I think the next I, I, I think on gay marriage he's forever, he's forever going to support it. I think on uh, transgender issues that he, he is his guts will tell him that it's absolutely nuts to, for, to do that mm -hmm. and to have schools be able to change his grandchildren's mm -hmm. genders without, without permission of his, of his daughter and mm -hmm. his sons. Mm -hmm. That he does personal uh, that goes yeah. Yeah. beyond the pale, and he would he would object he to that. So, That's me. Just so what we'd end up with is another patchwork. I think that one of the beauties of what happened with Reagan and why people keep pointing to him is when you know why you believe what you believe, you can sell the message to others, and then they come with you. When Reagan ran his second term, not one state or did we lose maybe one state. Mm -hmm. He just, lost, yeah, he lost. It's just like one state. All the rest of them came his way. We're, he lost we're, Massachusetts. The, the closeness of these elections now and the diversity of America, we've got to have stronger leadership to let us know why we believe what we believe. And But at the end of the day, I'm going to tell you something. Thanks, guys, for a panel. We'll be up again next week. But I'll tell you, I was thinking about it last week. I said, you know, I need to sort it through the noise of the news scripture. Because we're going to do that. We're going to look for truth. And then the Lord showed me one in Ecclesiastics. He said, here's the conclusion of the matter. <laughs> Didn't he say that? He yeah. said, here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Yeah. That's man's all. See you next week on Cure America. God birthed in my heart years ago to do this work of Cure, the Center for Urban Renewal and Education. We are incredibly privileged to have pastors from across the nation here for training and collaboration on solutions to help our communities. Freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. It must be fought for. The Declaration meant what it said. All men are created equal. We're to awaken, train, and mobilize the church as a whole, but the historically black church in particular, to end abortion in our communities. Every church needs to do everything it can to help be an educational hub. The crisis of the day is the sexual gone wrong, and it's going extraordinarily wrong. Us Christians are called to correct that by living the sexuality that God has given us. It was the church who created the idea of educating every boy and girl. The idea of public health care, guess where that came from? The church, and it was actually the church who was commissioned to do the work of charity. Guess who's actually robbed you a part of what it is that you're to do? It's government, and they failed miserably at it. They're not called to do it. Government is not God. Are we gonna bow to government, or are we gonna bow to God?
kids need to see that confidence that we have about the truth. We're not in doubt about who we are.